So it's time for a clock. So oh, it's time to get started. So good morning for Europe and a good afternoon Japan and good evening for the rest of the world. And welcome to our webinar, the coastal seascape we want, the voice of women scientists in the ocean research. I'm Mikiko Nagai, coordinator of Shikawa Kanazawa Operating Unit of United Nations University Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability. I'm very much happy to moderate today's event and celebrate World Oceans Day with you today. And on behalf of our unit, I'd also express my deepest gratitude to today's presenters to find time to talk to us. And on 8th June, as I said, today is the World Oceans Day. And this year, 2021, also marks the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And during this uh, ocean decade, ocean should be more studied from more various perspectives and including social science, as well as conventional study. So in this regard, today's topic, the, one of the most important issue are not really highlighted as its importance. So I hope we can have very, very fruitful discussion and to launch and explore the topic today. Okay, so before starting the session, I have a few housekeeping information for you, for participants. And all your IKEA webinar is always um, participatory and interactive and more relaxing. So we welcome your comments and questions. You can send us to send them to us from the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen of Zoom. And if you have any problem of communication or sound problem, you can also contact us via chat button or Q&A. So let's first so let's start our webinar. So first of all, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Ivan Yu for opening presentation. Uh, okay, yes. so you thank you. Start and you're now we're probably we the first person to do this uh, presentation. So uh, thank you all for coming to join us today. Uh, uh, on World Ocean Day, a happy World Ocean Day to everyone. I hope. Uh, you can, you are located near somewhere which you can see the sea today. So for the next 15 minutes or so, my talk will be on the UN Decade of Ocean Science, as well as uh, talking about some of the activities that we're doing here at uh, the Noto Sato Umi movement in our unit in Ishikawa. So first a little bit about myself and my love for the oceans. Uh, I'm born in sunny island country, Singapore. Uh, and my dad used to run an aquarium shop uh, when I was a kid. So that was probably how I got interested in marine creatures. But actually my love for the oceans really started in my year of exchange studies at Okinawa with the University of the Ryukyus where Piera, one of our speakers uh, currently works for and also Junko Sang uh, have also worked in Okinawa. And I also spent some years in the Miyazaki Prefecture in Japan, and they have one of the longest coastlines in Japan. And so you know why I really love to see that much. But the real uh, event that actually um, motivated my uh, pursuit of a career in uh, ocean research is the uh, Great Eastern Earthquake and Tsunami that happened in 2011 uh, in the Tohoku region in Japan, uh, witnessing the devastation to the coastal communities, uh, really let me thinking and I really wanted to um, be in this line to help coastal communities conserve their seascapes and maintain their livelihoods and that's why I pursued a uh, uh, PhD later in global fisheries. So on the oceans, um, this is the main messages that are coming out from the United Nations Ocean Conference in 2017 held in New York. Unfortunately it's due the first a conference. The second was supposed to be last year in Portugal, but it's postponed due to COVID. But nevertheless, uh, the conference uh, message wants us to know five things about the ocean, which is the ocean sustains life on earth for every one of us. And it protects us uh, with this regulatory atmospheric uh, functions. But unfortunately, humans are causing monumental damage and pressures on the ocean. And for that, we need to take urgent action to rectify uh, the situation 
and that solutions uh, exist. But when we think about what's happening to the oceans and we think about you know, ocean related problems, what naturally comes to your mind? Maybe marine pollution, uh, since I think the problem of plastic is quite heavily, all right, you know, increasingly discussed. But really, uh, in my uh, modest opinion, that the plastic problem is really just a tip of the iceberg of all the problems that are now happening to the oceans. And some of the areas here that you can see that we listed here uh, just reminds me how vastly um, different and uh, um, complex the, the problems and the issues that we're facing today with the oceans. And to help us to understand all these complex issues, that's why we need more signs uh, on the oceans to create, to restore, and to re-innovate the oceans that we want for the future. And for this decade, from this year to 2030, the UN has declared and designated the decade of uh, ocean signs for sustainable development. But apart from all the reasons that we need ocean signs, uh, really the situation of ocean science today as we look at this map that depicts the science, uh, the papers, scientific papers that are coming out from the regions of the world. Uh, the bigger you are, which means the more um, uh, papers that are coming out. And you can see this disproportionate uh, map representation and it, uh, of what's the situation now. And, and if you take a closer look, uh, places like regions like Africa's uh, are barely represented here, which means that there are a lot of information still not uh, coming out from the region enough. And also for Southeast Asia, where it houses the coral triangle, which is the is, which the cradle of ocean, the whole ocean life, is also quite uh, underrepresented. So there, we need to do more to get all this local information uh, or scientific information coming out. And that's why the uh, UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, uh, is hoping that the decade can provide impetus to not only governments, but all actors, all players uh, to, to come together for, for ocean action. And he has also designated uh, Sir Peter Thompson as the UN Special Envoy for the Oceans and for Mr. Thompson to uh, guide us through the decade of uh, ocean science. And what really the uh, decade of ocean science uh, aspires to do is that we hope to have this transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development uh, while connecting people and the oceans. Basically, uh, we hope that we can bridge science policy and local knowledge together, motivating actors from all sectors, all levels to come together for innovative uh, solutions uh, to protect, to, uh, to conserve our oceans. But it works under uh, the framework of uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, for, and to have that to help us identify some of the more post-pressure, uh, uh, pressing problems uh, related uh, to not only the SDGs 14, which is the uh, life uh, below water, but also related to us to SDGs. So actually very often when you look at the uh, UN discussions on oceans, now we refer all the time back to SDGs 14 uh, as really like a common language and of understanding a common goal of uh, what uh, we inspire to do. So I, I do encourage you to look up on SDGs 14 and other SDGs as well uh, after this webinar, if you're not yet familiar. But it also stresses that um, because the ocean is so complex, our action needs to span across disciplines uh, and have to integrate natural and social science disciplines together. And it also acknowledges the importance that we embrace local and uh, indigenous knowledge as the key source of knowledge to help us conserve uh, our oceans. And for that, uh, the Ocean Decade Framework uh, sets out to achieve seven major outcomes so, uh, here listed here for a cleaner ocean, more healthy and resilient ocean, a predictable ocean, a safer one, and one that produces uh, and harvests sustainably, and a more transparent ocean where we have more information and also a more inspiring, engaging ocean that we all want to be part of. And for us to do that, we have to first overcome a series of challenges, some of which are already highlighted in my presiding slide, but also more importantly, we need to really get the knowledge out and also more importantly, the last icon here in purple to really reestablish our relationship with the, with the ocean. 
And for that, there are many actions that we can take. Some of your listed here are the areas of actions that we can take. For example, uh, coastal zone management, uh, marine spatial planning, but also related to the livelihoods of the blue economy, and also establishing marine protected areas or other areas uh, to help restore our marine ecosystems. And of course, managing our fisheries sustainably and then how with the, of the knowledge of the ocean bridge it back to the discussions that's happening with the climate uh, discussions and also uh, having more research, uh, getting in this, these research outcomes into policies, then contributing to capacity building and also that safeguarding ourselves if we can have also early warning systems uh, of all ocean hazards. But then when I look at the uh, Ocean Decade uh, website, uh, no offense, but I realized that uh, when uh, we, the ocean science is defined, it defines that it combines a variety of discipline, but it's limit, but it only states here that's physical, geological, chemical, oceanography, and marine biology. It seems that it's still very inclined to only natural sciences, but nevertheless, it also acknowledged that ocean science can then support business operations like fisheries, shipping, aquaculture, and also will be useful for conservation activities, but doesn't explicitly say that it's ocean, uh, natural, social science or economics are part of ocean science. But here at UNU, we do feel that the study of ocean is, as, is complex and it, it should be multi and interdisciplinary. And then we hope to see that more of the social economic disciplines and people maybe like yourselves uh, who are watching us, if you're, you are a social or economist uh, scientist, that you can also contribute uh, to help us holistically understand the drivers uh, and the impacts of the ocean issues that we are facing today. And indeed, economics and livelihoods and the lives of the people are very important. And that's why today the theme of the World Oceans Day is the ocean, life and livelihoods. Uh, it is so because the ocean not only supports our livelihoods, we, when engaging in our livelihood, in turn, help to contribute to the conservation of uh, the oceans. It's actually a two-way relationship. But it can only be a two-way if we used uh, and maintain the resources sustainably. And that usually doesn't come uh, intuitively. Uh, sometimes it has to be taught. It has, there has to be capacity building uh, for, for people who are, lives are dependent on the ocean livelihoods as well. But at the same time, their knowledge can also teach us about how we look at the oceans. So ocean and ocean livelihoods, uh, um, I think not, not only necessarily limited to fisheries, but it also can uh, include uh, people in the marine leisure or sports and also seafood processing and even uh, to restaurants, culinary uh, and also tourism and also research and other conservation uh, forms of livelihoods. And very often because these ocean livelihoods are small scale fishers and many of them are coastal communities, they actually do have rich knowledge uh, with regards to how to maintain and conserve the marine environment and resources. And, but we shouldn't have the responsibility only relying on them to conserve the oceans for us because we are also benefiting from the oceans. Every one of us here sitting in our comfortable rooms uh, on watching this webinar, we have a part to play and this needs to be a whole of society effort to bring about uh, various expertise and uh, manpower actually to help us conserve the oceans. And looking at fisheries, why is fishery important? Actually 12% of the world fisheries are dependent on small scale uh, fishers. Uh, and many of them, are, about half of them are women. And coastal fisheries are actually supporting a large portion of our food and livelihoods. And here at UNUIAS or UIK, we believe that coastal seascapes are really very important marine ecosystems. And in the Japanese term, we have a term for that and it's called the Sato Umi, because we believe that these coastal seascapes are the cradle of ocean life. Uh, we do have life, of course, in the high seas or the offshore, but actually um, fishes and all other marine lives, most of them breed, nurture, feeds at the coastal areas before they move on to the further seas. So if we don't have a conducive environment for them to grow. Let's not talk about fish stocks. Let's not talk about the, the resources. We need to first 
have this environment for them to bounce back, for them to grow. So uh, in OEYK, we look at uh, the study of the Sato Umi concept and all the Sato Yama as well. Well, Sato is actually a concept of inhabited nature where people reside, live in the settlements. The, it literally means human settlements. So Sato Umi combined is the coastal settlements and then on the terrace straw on the land, you have Sato Yama. But because you have people, you have way of life, you have livelihoods. And so when we look, when we seek to understand these coastal communities, we have to respect not only the nature, we also have to consider their, their culture and also the livelihoods involved. So we look at uh, the coastal livelihoods in these three uh, areas. But this is a typical uh, landscape and seascape, Sato Yama Sato Umi uh, scenery that I always see in Noto Peninsula, whereby you have all these coastal settlements you see, they're really located, their houses at the brink of the coast. And then they have forests and they have uh, farmlands where the fish and they farm at all together. And because of these coastal settlements and of the diverse seascapes and landscapes that they have in the Noto Peninsula of Ishikawa, we really still have today uh, many kinds of traditional fisheries, all this in the black boxes that I've listed, that still practice today. And with that, uh, rich knowledge of how they conserve their uh, Sato Umi seascapes. And so uh, in um, 2015, our unit decides to have launched this research and outreach effort to help it, actually the locals to understand uh, better their seascapes uh, of these uh, Noto region. This is because in 2011, they are actually designated as the first uh, globally important agricultural heritage assistance for Japan. Uh, but uh, under this uh, concept of Noto Sato Yama Sato Umi. But while well, it's easy to get involved on the land uh, activities, but it's not so easy to get into the sea. So the locals wanted, wondered how they could actually be part of it. So we started this movement uh, to raise the awareness of uh, the livelihoods of uh, ocean livelihoods uh, through uh, outreach events, uh, seminars, uh, research and conservation efforts. In the interest of time, I do not have time to tell you all about the movement, but maybe more just on the seminars that we've done thus far. In the early years, we did more like a study group thing with the local communities. Uh, although it's a study group, the turnout is always 80 to 100 people. And we really discussed very, very localized issues. Like they were interested in knowing what is happening to the seaweed baits, uh, what's happening to the shellfish, and also blue tourism, as, as well as the rural women and fisheries. And with that, uh, we had actually a synthesis symposium on livelihoods uh, in Tokyo in 2017. In the later years, we then brought this uh, information to, uh, to outside of the, the region, to Tokyo and to overseas, and also our media outreach out efforts uh, to let people understand the concept of Sato Umi in the Noto region. Uh, we have put together a publication. Uh, if you have time, I uh, welcome you to refer to that. But actually, this year, just a year ago, I mean, last from last year, we wanted to restart the seminar. But unfortunately, or fortunately with COVID, we weren't able to do the physical meetings that we had, but we were able to do a webinar. And, uh, and this time we addressed specifically on SDG issues, looking at thematics like pollution, biodiversity, resource management, as well as the ocean uh, climate change. And every time we have an expert in Noto region together with industry stakeholder and other actors. And these are all documented uh, video. It's not only in Japanese, but uh, if you're interested, you can still read. And this is probably one of my last concluding slides, but also the synthesis of our findings thus far in the Noto Sato Umi movement that we understand that Sato Umi conservation, when we look at it, it's really about conserving through sustainable use. And also very much often dependent on those people who likely could depend on the ocean. And these way, their ways of managing the resources are often based on traditional wisdom, local knowledge and communal rules. And they're often unique to the local experience because every sea is different. And they're also very concerned about the sustainability of their blue economy and also the social cohesion of the communities with changing demographics. Um, um, and they want uh, researchers to help them uh, understand and find a way out to this. And they also very clear uh, understanding of the interconnectedness of the land and sea. The fishers understand that the, the nutrients uh, to the ecosystems come from the land. But unfortunately, the pollutants also come 
are often very land-based. So we really have to address this connection between the land and the sea when we look at uh, sea issues. And with the changing ocean and a changing society, many challenges, uh, coastal fisheries are in need of the science to help them make better uh, informed decisions. And at the same time, enable their knowledge to be then also updated uh, and implemented uh, into the science and policy. And through the course of my years uh, um, championing this movement, I met a lot of fabulous women in the fisheries, uh, in the Noto Sato Umi, who taught me things from manning a uh, fish net to, to really sorting out fishes. And also uh, these fabulous speakers who have uh, also supported me in many ways in our uh, seminars. As you can see, we have fishers, we have divers, we have fish and corporate stuff, and also to uh, a Liu Khan uh, owner, and then women can really be such great supporters of the oceans. So today we also have with us a fabulous lineup of women, uh, scientists, activists for the oceans, uh, Piera, which is now is in Italy, but was just in Okinawa a few months ago with us, and she will share uh, with us on her research in Okinawa, and so Jun Kosan from the Ocean Pole uh, Sea Research Institute. And she really has a uh, great knowledge of what's happening to the Sato Umis in Japan. And we will hear from her. And also then from Elena, also my friend, uh, social uh, ocean activist um, located in Fujisawa City. And she will also tell us how then we can mobilize people for the ocean cause. And today we look forward uh, to coming back at the end, uh, the four of us, including also Miki Kosan. Uh, on the discussion for the questions that you might have for us. So let's, I will see you later and thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for a very um, comprehensive presentation and with very beautiful photos of a woman. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now let's move on to the uh, case uh, presentation. So I would like to invite Piera to the floor Hello. Can Hello, you good morning. Oh, yes. Good morning. Okay. Can I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Um, here. Can you see? Perfect. So thank you. And it's a pleasure to talk to you all today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and about the research that I have conducted in Okinawa uh, without getting too in detail about the science since this is not really a science talk. So, uh, sorry, I'm trying to move on. Okay. Um, so my name is Piera Biondi and I am an Italian researcher. I have uh, graduated in Italy for my master's degree in marine biology uh, in 2016. Uh, and then I, I came to Okinawa after that to, do, um, to conduct my PhD in marine and environmental sciences. So I am right now I'm a doctor in uh, marine biology. And moreover, I am also a training manager for a new uh, NGO that is called the Ocean Sea, uh, with a focus to on the sustainability and the promotion of sustainable and green tourism. Um, okay, so why do I love the ocean? So my love for the ocean started when I actually was very young. Uh, that picture is me when I was about seven or eight years old. And I started loving the ocean because I used to spend uh, all my holidays, summer holidays in Sicily, uh, which is the southern island of Italy. Um, so I fell in love with the Mediterranean Sea and the, the blue of the ocean. I like to play in, with in the water and I, I like to observe everything that was underwater since I was very young. All this picture that you can see on the right, it's from Sicily. And so um, my love for the ocean made me want to study it and to protect the ocean. And so I decided when I was very, very young, I was about seven, that I want to become, become a marine biologist. And so I, I followed that dream and, and I decided to study the ocean. 
And growing up, I also noticed that the ocean, the ocean was facing many threats. And like, for example, the plastic pollution or the overfishing or everything that Yvonne San was saying just now. And so I became even more motiv motivated about studying uh, what I want, want to protect. Um, so yeah, I graduated in marine biology and I also became a diver uh, in 2014 uh, because I, I wanted to explore more about the ocean. Uh, okay, so about my research, I conducted my PhD in Okinawa at the University of the Ryukyu. Uh, and my PhD was focused on coral reef restoration. And I also worked as a um, collaboration and co-author uh, on the effect of coastal construction with um, Dr. Giovanni Masucci. And today I'm going to explain you a little bit about this researcher. So about my PhD, uh, the coral reef restoration is conducted in Okinawa since few years already. It's performed by the Okinawa prefecture uh, for this big project since 2011. So for my PhD, I was monitoring the um, the reef restoration that was conducted in Onna village in Okinawa. And we were trying to find new methods to assess if this restoration was actually increasing the biodiversity, increasing the coral cover. So I was monitoring uh, from 2017 to 2020, which was the period of my PhD. And um, what I did was to, uh, to evaluate the, the effect of the restoration on the coral cover and also on the um, cryptofauna biodiversity. And for who doesn't know, the cryptofauna are all those little creatures that live uh, hidden maybe in the corals or in the coral rubble, so that corals. So we cannot really see them because they are big, but they, they live hidden in the reef. And they are important because they are a big part of the biodiversity. So I collected all these um, animals, organisms from coral rubble, from dead corals basically, uh, comparing the area where the restoration was performed and areas where the restoration wasn't performed. What we noticed is that actually there was not a big increasing of biodiversity or the coral cover in these uh, restoration areas. So what I suggested is that reef restoration also needs some sort of protection when it, uh, it's done. And also that besides restoration, it's important the conservation because of course it's easier to conserve and to protect our unhealthy reef instead of destroying it and then trying to um, restore it again, because that you know, takes much more effort and much more money. Uh, okay, and then about this study, I was doing it in collaboration with Dr. Giovanni Masucci. Um, and we use the same method. So basically we evaluated the, the effect of the coastal construction or also on a cryptofauna biodiversity. So still little creatures living inside dead corals. This picture you can see on the right, they are both from Okinawa. The, the top one is the north of Okinawa and the bottom one, uh, I think it's uh, the Sunabe area. So it's one of the most constructed areas. And you can see really the differences between the two coasts. Um, what emerged from this study is that the artificial sites uh, were characterized by a reduced abundance and diversity of this um, cryptofauna. So the presence of the seawall reduced the diversity. And finally, this is not my study. This is a study of my colleague uh, Giovanni Masucci, but I wanted to show, show you because it's really interesting and uh, a little bit shocking to me. This is a map that it was uh, drawn by, uh, by him about the um, uh, coastline of Okinawa. 
And it's a coastline alteration map. So the red lines are the line that um, where it's conducted landfill. So basically concrete was uh, uh, pulled on, on the coral rift and the green lines are the natural coastline. Uh, yellow and orange are a middle way between the two. Uh, what emerged is that less of the than 40% of Okinawa coastline remain in a natural status. Uh, if I'm not wrong, this map, it's up to 2018. So it's, probably that uh, possible that now it's even worse and 63% uh, of the coastline is altered so this is a big number and I think it's really important that we understand that we should protect what remains natural of the coastline of Okinawa okay and so how's my research related to this ocean day well, of course, I was studying coral reefs. So coral reefs support about 25% of marine biodiversity. And also life of millions of people depends on them because more, of, more than 275 million of people live within the 30 kilometer from um, coral reef. So they support many, many uh, people with uh, fish, fishing or also tourism. And so, Preserving and restoring coral reef and the coastal environment is really critical for the quality of livelihood of people. And why are the coastal seascapes so important for a healthy ocean? So um, as Yvonne San was saying just now, I want to say it again, several ecosystems like the seagrass meadow, coral reefs, wetlands and mangroves only exist in shallow areas of which uh, the main part is the, is the coastline. So of course, if we destroy these areas, we lose a big um, part of, the, of this ecosystem. And also these same areas also represents nurseries of species uh, that uh, when they grow up, they will move to the pelagic water when they are adults. So if we destroy these areas, we destroy the, um, the nursery and we don't give the, the creature to the possibility to have a, a reproduction area and so it's it's really uh, destructive for the for the whole biodiversity so it is important to preserve this ecosystem and okay i i'm done and i want to thank you all of you for listening and of course i did i didn't go too in detail for or for the science part but if you have any question you can ask me or you can also email me anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Piera, for your presentation. Also with very critical information inside as well. So thank you. So let's now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Junko Toyoshima, Junko-san, for the case study on the effectiveness of Japan Satomi type integrated coastal management for biodiversity conservation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please let me start my uh, presentation. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Junko Toyoshima from uh, Ocean Policy Research Institute. Today, I want to talk about a study we did last year on the ef effectiveness of Japan's Satomi type integrated coastal management for biodiversity conservation. Um, okay, first, uh, please let me introduce myself a little bit. I graduated from International Christian University and then I did my master's at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, this is a coconut island in Hawaii where I did my uh, master's study. And then I did my PhD at Tokyo Institute of Technology. And for the work experience, I changed my jobs a few times, but uh, these are particularly related to oceans. So I worked for Okinawa Churami Aquarium and also for International Coral Reef Research and Monitoring Center uh, in Ishigaki Island, and uh, also for Japan Wildlife Research Center, where uh, we 
the uh, developed uh, national strategy for uh, protection of coral reefs. And here now I work for Ocean Policy Research Institute since 2019. Okay, so um, to give you some background of my, my our study, uh, Sato Umi is defined as coastal areas where high productivity and biodiversity conservation are achieved through human intervention in harmony with natural ecosystems. So in other words, Sato Umi is a, a result of activities by local people to protect and nurture the ocean in their own backyard. And the uh, number of such Satomi activities are increasing. Uh, and uh, in the report produced by Ministry of Environment, uh, now there are as many as 291 cases reported across Japan. And Satomi is, of course, unimportant uh, in the context of biodiversity conservation. And at uh, COP10 of Con Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010, Satomi caught international attention and a technical report was published by CBD Secretariat. So uh, 10 years has passed since then. So we were wondering uh, what is the effect of Satomi on biodiversity? So uh, we started from uh, these uh, research questions. Uh, so how have Japan's Satomi activities uh, been continued? And how was the biodiversity and productivity of the Satomi actually been maintained or improved by the Satomi activities? And what are, what are the factors that contribute to the success of Satomi activities? And the objective of the study was to verify with data how the Satomi approach is effective in conserving biodiversity and ecosystem services. And if we could prove the effectivity, we wanted to contribute to the discussion on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will be discussed at CBD COP15 this year. So the method we used was a literature review so we collected uh, existing data, uh, such as uh, fishery statistics. And we also wanted to conduct a site visit survey, but uh, that could not happen uh, because of uh, COVID-19. So we did the online interview surveys instead. And uh, these are four, uh, four of our study sites, Shiretoko and Nanao Bay and Ago Bay and uh, Bizen City. But I won't have enough time to cover all of this. So I will focus on three uh, sites uh, except Nanao Bay because uh, Yvonne-san already touched on Nanao Bay uh, briefly. So the first case is uh, Shiretoko. So as you know, Shiretoko is very famous for rich bio biodiversity and also unique ecosystem uh, where the terrestrial and marine ecosystem interact. And uh, because of that, the area was inscribed on UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, in 2005. So fishery has been practiced in this area by but the catch of Pollock crashed in the 1990s. Tourism is also important in this area, but the negative impact on seabirds from cruise ships was a concern. So in order to manage uh, the coastal ecosystems, the national government, local governments, and uh, business and fishery operators worked together to comprehensively manage the World Heritage Area and formulated the multiple use integrated uh, marine management plan. Also, voluntary efforts were made by fishermen and tourism operators, such as uh, setting no take downs and developing tourism guidelines. As a result of these efforts, the quality of ecosystem seems to be maintained at sustainable level. So IUCN reported none of the species in this area is threatened. And the catch of plaque is still low, but the fishery production value is maintained by combining other fish species. 
also um, salmon spawning is on increasing trend as a result of uh, uh, river structure improvement. And negative impact uh, on seabird was reduced and uh, seabird population is showing recovery. Uh, sorry, I don't have uh, time to go into much details. So I'm uh, skimming on the surface of my slides. Okay, um, the next case is Ago Bay in the prefecture. Uh, this is an enclosed sea area with locked coastline and a historically important place for providing food to East Asia. And recently, pearl and seaweed aquaculture became two major industries. However, um, as a result of land reclamation, about 70% of the tidal fats had disappeared, which had important ecosystem functions, such as uh, supporting biodiversity and water purification. Also, due to the inflow of domestic uh, sewage and overcrowded power cultivation, uh, water quality deteriorated, causing uh, frequent red tides. And the Satoumi activities in this area uh, included many projects, such as uh, improvement of sewage treatment system and uh, tidal flood uh, restoration projects. And uh, so the restoration first uh, started by local power cultivators, uh, but later the government and the scientists and other private sector became involved and the Satomi activity was scaled up and eventually Sima City became the first city in Japan to incorporate uh, Satomi coastal management in the policy of municipality and established a department designated to Satomi uh, promotion. Okay, so then what happened to the uh, ecosystems? And uh, this graph shows the number of species in the restored tidal flats and it increased from uh, six species to 35 species in two years. So biodiversity was actually recovered and the COD of bottom sediment uh, decreased. Uh, the data from other monitoring sites in Ago Bay shows that biodiversity index was maintained at constant level but suddenly decreased uh, in 2019. We don't know the reason for this uh, drop. And for Ago Bay, socioeconomic uh, effects are also remarkable, such as tourism promotion under the name of Sato Umi and educational events, outdoor events and sports events are held to increase awareness. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, case study. The uh, last example is Hinase area in the Bizen city. This is also in coast area uh, facing Seto Naikai, consisting of 13 islands. Uh, this area has been traditionally known for fishery activities. However, due to economic development and land reclamation, the area of seagrass beds decreased from um, 590 hectares to 12 hectares by 1985. Water and sediment quality also deteriorated and red tides frequently occurred. The number of Tsubonet fishery uh, operators also decreased from 100 to 3. Uh, here, Sato Umi conservation activity uh, started in 1985, and uh, local fishermen started uh, to uh, restore the um, irgrass beds. Uh, and uh, this activity is be, has been continued until now. And they also developed a unique technique to improve bottom sediment by uh, sprinkling uh, oyster shells. Uh, these, are, these oyster shells are waste from uh, oyster aquaculture. And eventually, uh, much wider groups of stakeholders became involved in the Satomi activities such as OPRI and Okayama Co-op and local schools and uh, Bizen City. And so what happened to the ecosystems? Uh, this green area shows, shows the area of eel grass bed. 
So it almost disappeared by 1985, but the restoration activity was started and then seagrass bed uh, recovered to one, uh, 250 hectares by 2015. And some fish stocks and invertebrates also came back. The success of Hinase Sea uh, showed good example and eelgrass restoration activities spread to other coastal area in Okayama prefecture and even other prefectures in Japan. Okay, in conclusion, uh, as we saw in the case of Bizen and other sites, Satomi activities are supported by continuous efforts and innovative thinking of the local people. And it was proved by data, Satomi activities can be effective in improving the water and sediment quality, recovering and maintaining ecosystems and biodiversity from degradation and maintaining fish catches. And the involvement of many stakeholders, especially fishermen and the private sector is a key to the success. And we also saw uh, two, uh, two things are important for the success uh, that are existing of key person or agency and uh, setting clear and common goals among the stakeholder. Uh, also, uh, there were two uh, common issues came up during the interviews. Uh, that were um, recruiting younger generations to continue the activities and also impact of climate change on the local ecosystem. Um, so all of the interviewees feel that sea temperature is rising by one to three degrees on average, and that has effect on local ecosystem and fish catch. So there is an emerging issue how to manage uh, sato umi in the changing climate. Um, okay, that's all I, I have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Junko, for your uh, having shared your uh, detailed survey for each case places. Thank you very much again. So we have already received uh, questions, many questions. So we will pick them up our uh, during our panel discussion. So uh, now let's move on to uh, last case presentation. I would like to invite uh, Alana, sorry, Alana, for your exciting activity. Okay, so thank you, I'm thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mikiko. I'm going to try to share my screen now. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation for today. And I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit uh, different, not quite as scientific, um, but from the heart, so science with the heart. So I'd like to start first with telling you a little bit about why you know we do this kind of activity at uh, Sego Initiative. Um, let's see. So here's a bit of outline. Um, I'll talk about love, uh, inspiration and focus, looking at life and livelihood, and then healthy coast and healthy oceans. So let's start with love, my favorite topic. Why did we start Sego Initiative? Um, actually, it's because we were really, really uh, from areas um, where there's a sea. I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago, so the Caribbean Sea. Uh, then I moved to Canada, Lake Ontario uh, in, in Toronto. Uh, my husband, Michel, is from Nice, so the Mediterranean Sea. And then when we moved to Japan, actually we moved first to uh, Kagoshima, uh, in Izumi, more specifically Nishi Izumi, um, and a very, very local area. And we always, we always went to the sea that was close by. Now we are in um, Fujisawa, uh, about 800 meters from Kugenuma Kaigan. So Sagami Bay is now our area. And when we, we bought our house here, um, we wanted to do something that would bring us closer to the local communities. We wanted to be a bridge between foreign community and the local community. So this was our kind of motivation. Love brought us together. It connected us. It brought us to, <laughs> to Japan together. But the sea has always been that connector for us. Um, and so that's why we started um, with the Fujisawa Beach Cleaning Project in 2009. 
And so why did we start this particular project? This is what we see in our local Kuganuma Shonan areas. You can see lots of surfers. And you know, when we went for walks, we could see sailing, we can see surfing, but we could also see other things that didn't quite belong there. Um, and as you can see in the middle um, photo, there's a quite a bit of trash that would come through um, the, from the rivers. Uh, I think everybody understands that about 78 to 80% of uh, the marine pollution actually goes along, enters the oceans from the rivers. Um, so when we noticed that, we thought, okay, well, this is something that we can do. It's, some, it's an activity that everyone can understand. You don't need to speak French, English, Japanese. Everybody knows what a clean beach is. So why not do something like this? And our idea at the very beginning was to create a corporate social responsibility uh, initiative. And this is primarily because we would see all these surfers who would surf early morning, six o'clock in the morning, get on their trains and commute into Tokyo, going to work. So they lived in the area for a certain quality of life. But you know, when they go to work, go into Tokyo, into the head office, most of the corporate social responsibility initiatives were around the head office. So why not bring the love back to where the work, where the employees actually live or where they or where they play and, and show and engage with employees that way. And that was another way, a deeper way, a deeper touch point um, to have more employee uh, engagement. So that was one of the ideas as well. So we focused on bringing uh, a sort of employee engagement, yes, but bringing people to something that was tangible and real and connecting these kinds of small movements into a global um, kind of uh, wave of trying to mitigate ocean pollution, trying to understand where it comes from, trying to look at the local area and understanding that this is touching people in other areas as well around the world. So we started in 2009 with our Fujisawa Beach Cleaning Project, which over the years grew and grew. And in 2014, we launched a SIGO initiative. We've been very, very fortunate in the sense that many um, corporate supporters have seen interest in it. It's a way for them to put um, a real and a concrete action on some of the SDGs uh, goals that they're trying to, to accomplish, looking at some of their corporate social um, responsibility initiatives. We also were looking at a family-friendly um, kind of balanced event where people could share their values and pass their values on to their, their kids. So a lot of um, students also come out and participate as well. The idea again was people were giving up their time to, vol to volunteer. Yes, they understand, but the, the time, family time is precious. So how do you keep that work-life balance as well? So this is one of the things that we were looking at. Um, over the years, uh, so the Fujisawa Beach Cleaning Project, we call it the Sato Umi Project, um, has grown into three key pillars. Um, of course, volunteering, um, where the students, where the employees, their families, when people come out and volunteer uh, in large cleanups, about 300 to 600 uh, volunteers, depending on the year. Um, and then we do public education, which is educating people about what they're going to find. Um, a lot of people come out with these kinds of ideas. They're going to really find huge chunks of garbage and like removing tires and, and it's not quite as exciting as that. So looking at microplastic, which is extremely dangerous and, and um, making them understand that even these really small pieces of plastic are really critical in um, mitigating ocean pollution. Um, so public education, and we also use art as a way to do that as well, and reconnecting to the marine environment. Um, so we thought that if people could get into the water, closer to the water, uh, they could understand the beauty um, and feel the fragility of the, of the marine ecosystem and understand why it's important to protect um, the this, this system. So those are the three key pillars. We had another small, um, uh, project. Um, we call that the Satoyama project. And again, we're looking at organic farming and reminding people again that pollutants, yes, nutrients and pollutants come from the come from the earth, come from further inland. And so we, we looked at getting people to work with very small uh, organic farmers, understanding how they work, understanding what help they needed, and, and trying to understand just how um, things would flow into the rivers flow down into um, the, the oceans coming from the agricultural sector as well. 
Um, we didn't discuss too much about uh, plastic in the agriculture sector, uh, sector per se, but we were looking specifically at, okay, looking at an organic kind of um, uh, farming as opposed to regular farming. Um, and so what we did in 2020 because of COVID-19 was try to reach out more on a virtual level, primarily because our in-person volunteer activities had to be curtailed. So we started off with an educational webinar series and we were very fortunate, Yvonne kindly agreed to st start us off. And we had a few other um, uh, scientists as well uh, from the University of Toronto, Ocean Conservancy with whom we work um, to provide the citizen science and the data sheets that we do during our, our beach cleanups. Uh, they also um, participated and we had also the artists speak. And our idea with art was one, was a way again to reach people, not necessarily using a words. How can you get people to change behavior? You know, how can you motivate people? How can you give them the space to, to imagine, to reimagine a future that they would like without this kind of uh, ocean pollution? Um, we, we thought that that, would, that art would be one way to do that. And we were quite fortunate to have four artists who work with um, recycled plastic, who work with beach plastic, who are really, you know, top of their game, basically, to, to agree to, uh, to allow us to use their photos. And we were able to do an exhibition on the beach and then later on in uh, Fujisawa City Hall. And this became virtual and it became the kind of gathering point um, for us to basically meet online and discuss and share our ideas and learn. Because one of the things we think as a citizen science scientist, it's it, you need to be informed from the scientific from the science part. And, and as a citizen science, you're basically doing the observation, the participatory, the collaboration part. But you, you need that kind of background information to be able to know, you know, what are we looking for, um, you know, how to make sense sometimes of what we see. Um, so this kind of educational webinar series was something that um, that helped us uh, quite a lot. Um, and I guess, you know, healthy coasts and healthy oceans, I mean, for me, it seems kind of obvious if your coasts are, if it's streams of plastic going into your coast, this is the, if you reverse engineer, if you go back from the coast back inland, you're choking yourself, basically. I think of beaches as filters, and right now it's filtering out, filtering out a lot of many things, many, many things that it's not supposed to be filtering out. So I think there is such a, a connection between um, the whole system of you know land and sea uh, that it, it seems normal to say that if the coasts are breathing then we are breathing and then the sea is breathing um, and if we can understand that if we can kind of communicate that in different ways whether it's through a scientific paper whether it's through art whether it's through come out and actually do a cleanup whatever way whatever touch point we can we can use I think this would be the best way to kind of get to educate and, and get people to, to talk more about this. Um, I think I've been very, very short. Um, and I thought that this would be the best way to kind of stop here. Um, please ask questions. I, I think people are kind of curious about how to start their own movement and how to start their own kind of activities to, to get on board and just, share their own uh, observations with what they are seeing locally. And just again, tying it into what's going on globally because it really is a global movement and this is everywhere at the moment. So thank you very much um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Alana, for your presentation, which highlighted also another perspective of very important uh, how way how we connect uh, the ocean and our lives as well. So now, uh, thank you very much uh, for all uh, presenters. And let's, so now let's move on to the panel discussion uh, part. So here I would like to give the microphone to Yvonne as moderator and uh, yeah, floor is yours. Sure. Uh, yeah, so for the rest of the webinars, I think we will be having just uh, discussions among ourselves and also addressing some of those questions and comments coming from our participants. And once again, thank you, friends, for giving us uh, all your fabulous presentations. I think it started our conversation uh, well today, but 
since uh, we are all ladies, all women <laughs> here today, I would just like to start our conversation by just asking you uh, your experience as a woman, uh, ocean researcher, activist, how is it like, um, do you have any challenges or do you think there are advantages to share with us? What is it like to be a woman in ocean research? Anybody can start. I can say <laughs> that oh, <okay>. yeah. <laughs> I didn't really feel a big difference being a woman, which I think is good because I think there shouldn't be any differences between the sex. So um, I actually met many, many women researchers and professors, which I uh, became friends with. So um, I'm glad that also women can do research nowadays. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't really feel a big difference. I don't know if maybe some of you had before, but I think this is, this is already a good point. Uh, if there are no difference, it means it's, it's something good, no? Definitely, yes, I think too. And what about Junko? What about your experience working in so many countries? You know, do you feel there's a difference? Or yeah, um, uh, actually, I haven't felt any difference. But uh, when I think about it, uh, when maybe when choosing career, like women had more freedom to do whatever you know they want to do. Like men tend to go for like uh, you know um, you know high paying job or like so stable jobs, but women can be more adventurous. <laughs> so <more> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's an advantage. So that's true. That's true. And what yeah. about you, Elena? How how does it feel? Um, I think um, challenges. Yeah, of course, there are challenges, of course, um, not necessarily being a woman, but perhaps being a foreigner and having to convince uh, local authorities or maybe speaking with the Japanese companies. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult, but on the other hand, sometimes it's much easier because you can reach out and actually say things and make mistakes and, and it's more, more forgiving. Um, so it really depends. And um, I think as a woman, and maybe one kind of advantage is um, that we can actually, um, how can I say? Yeah, we can actually ask for more, you know? We can ask, mm -hmm. not for more. We, we actually don't ask for more. We ask more. Um, we <laughs> okay. reach out and ask we for help. help to more <laughs> delicate issues, dig deeper. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, as a women researcher myself, and uh, well, people, my friends are quite surprised that I go to fishing uh, communities myself, and they say, won't you worry? Well, of course, first I would get the, the very interesting stares, like, why is this lady doing in our, uh, our community? But then that interest actually works to my advantage. People are friendly to me, and then they are quite interested to know what, what I'm up to. And I think that it's actually quite an advantage sometimes. But also I think as women researchers, we tend to be more concerned of, of the people aspect as well. And especially the, the state of the women in this industry, I mean, in, in the fishery industry, in the ocean industry as well. We, we also we reach out uh, to people. So I guess uh, I would agree with Piera, it's, it, it's increasing get that there's no difference. But I, I would like to also shout out to uh, those uh, women or maybe young women who are watching us today. If you are interested in ocean uh, studies, please just come. There's no, there's no gender difference in this, in this area as, as we think it is. But having said that, I also want uh, to highlight the role of women in uh, ocean livelihoods. I, as I've said in my presentation, I work with a lot of fabulous ladies um, in the Noto region also, uh, not only in Japan, but also in my course of work in Philippines and in Myanmar, they taught me so much. How, how has women uh, been supporting your work and what do you th think are their roles in, in uh, ocean communities? Maybe I can start with Junko. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm thinking about Japan and maybe in Okinawa, like, uh, yeah, well, marine, ocean-related, like, livelihood, uh, like, uh, 
yeah, usually uh, done by men. So I cannot think of many women, <laughs> actually. So maybe I want, you know, more representation of women in this uh, field in the future. So I think, that, you know, Japanese society needs to, you know, change. I think there are a lot of women in, in this uh, supporting revolution by people, but they tend to take a back. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, they are yeah, kind of like invisible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we often have to nudge them yeah. into coming out to to the limelight, <laughs> like, uh, to to actually share the experience, and that's really mm -hmm. important. And Alana, what about you? Uh, from where you're originally from, and where and then you've been to Canada, and you know all across the world, what what is your understanding of women's role in the oceans? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. I think, yeah, that runs the gamut of, you know, people protecting the oceans, people wanting to protect the ocean for the future generations, for sure, ocean activists. Maybe, you know, not as um, a big scale, you know, maybe not as much publicity, people are quietly doing their, 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 their activities. Um, so there's that side. And then it's also, you look at um, tourism and a lot of the, for example, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, a huge population, you know, involved in tourism, in, tur in Tobago specifically, and yeah, there's quite quite a number of women, you know, involved in that as having their guest houses and looking at, um, you know, um, just looking at all the the kind of domino uh, effects of tourism on on the local, you know, local economy as well. So I think it really does run run the gamut. And you know, for for me in Japan, I think the very first. Um, people, first person that I was speaking to about ocean activism and um, understanding some of the problems uh, here in Japan was a, a woman, a very kind Japanese woman who explained to me what they were doing at their organization and um, what kind of issues, what kind of challenges um, um, were being faced. So it, it was, it was, yeah, for sure, very, very strong, uh, active um, women are here, not in the front, but they're there. <laughs> I'm sure, and you raise a very good point that there are a lot of women also in the tourism industry, uh, the marine tourism industry, and and with that, I can only think of Okinawa, uh, and because my diving instructor was uh, was a lady as well. So, Pierre, in in your course of uh, work in Okinawa, I'm sure you work with a lot of. Um, divers or a lot of people in ocean life because what do you think of uh, the women's role uh, in ocean conservation happening in Okinawa and also where in Italy where you're from? Yeah as I was saying just now I, I really met many many <laughs> ladies working in with the ocean not only conservancy but even when I was going for my research for sampling, I was uh, riding boats for from fishermen, and after the fishermen were um, along his uh, wives, so they were working together. Uh, she was um, guiding the boats as much as the uh, husband. So I don't think I've seen a, a big difference. Of course, you see many um, men doing the you know, uh, job like fishing and such, but about conservancy, I think, I think there are many, many girls and many ladies working on that. Also on social medias, there are some women that are very strong on social medias and they fight for ocean conservancy. So I think that's also a good point. Uh, but again, there are probably also many men. So I think, I think that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> there are, if there are no differences. It's actually really a balance, I, I guess. Uh, but very often when we talk about fishing, we say fishermen, but they're not only men, they're also fisherwomen. So uh, actually on a personal level, I've stopped using this word fisherman. I always I write fisher uh, in the academic papers I write, but sometimes they come back to me, what do you mean by fishers? Like <laughs> leisure fishing. But I really want to have like a gender, like uh, you know, neutral word for, for people building in, in the fisheries. And I hope that people can follow me and use the word fisher uh, rather than fisherman or women, because they're really, uh, you know, it's a balance of everybody here. I think I have some questions, but I think I would like to now take the opportunity to also pick up some rule of the questions that are coming in. So Mikiko-san, are there some good questions and interesting questions that you can pick up for us and let's see how much we can address them? Yeah, maybe I would like to introduce some questions combined. 
Uh, mm -hmm. This is about the, maybe the related to the women's role in coastal management. Some people asking about how about the role and the you know, protection or connection to the vulnerable people and settlement management. There is any uh, specific uh, connection that women are working in a settlement for their, for the vulnerable people's advantages. Do you have any ideas or? Do anyone have anything to share? Well, I personally know, uh, well, fishers that are women, uh, and especially in the Noto region, uh, and also some parts, other parts of Japan, ama women divers, they, they are the stakeholders themselves, and they dive and they pick up uh, shellfish or, or seaweed. So they actually do control uh, the amount of cash they, they do because they know that how much they reap now, that will actually have an impact of how much later they can get. So it's a very direct involvement. But I also think like uh, some of the examples that Alan has pointed out to us, like women activists, actually, you know, when you want to influence a family, you first uh, influence the mother, and then that cus that habit cascades through down the whole uh, family tree. And people uh, are actually more enthusiastic uh, to bring their families to, to understand on the oceans. So, so I think rural women in that sense uh, has a role to play, but my other speakers, do you have anything to add? I was also thinking about women in the marketplace, you know, like when um, the fish comes in, usually they're the ones who would probably have to sell it on the market. So they probably have to set the price. They also have to share recipes. How do you cook that? So, I mean, there, there are lots of, lots of roles that are, are there. Um, and yeah, and I, again, you know, we kind of take it for granted because it's just part of the system and we don't really think about, about what it is that women do, you know, in that sense, but yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I remember seeing, I remember seeing this in the market and I've seen it here as well in Japan, you know, when, you know, seeing them in the, in the shops, basically preparing the fish, getting it ready um, and um, also selling, you know, as well. So for sure. And they're the ones sharing those, those recipes. Exactly. How do you they're the ones teaching us what this, to eat, yeah. how to eat. Exactly. To eat. And that's, that means what the, the, the fishers are catching, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they are that connection. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, uh, kiko -san, that we can also address? Okay, so that this one is quite essential uh, about the coastal management. Uh, for the yes, for water management and disaster management, dams and the river control has been developed. But I, he think uh, this person think that hard that affect the coastal region such as shape and underground. Sorry, how, how do you think about? Also, how do you collaborate with the river and the forest management? He, okay, he, so it's land and sea connection. Maybe I think Junko can uh, give us some talks. Then maybe after Pierre can, can reinforce uh, the point about protecting coaster uh, coastlines. So Junko, do you have any idea? Um, yeah, I think it's important uh, to have like connectivity between like uh, you know forests and uh, coastal and also marine area. So there was an example in my talk about uh, salmon spawning came back because of the you know um, river structure uh, modification. So I think uh, they removed uh, dams and uh, you know uh, they made uh, salmon can you know swim to <laughs> upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that was that had a effect, good effect on uh, the ecosystem. So that's an uh, example of, uh, yeah, yeah that connectivity. So, so there's also a case uh, addressing to the question from the uh, participants that there are also instances where we they work with the river management agencies and then yeah. you know, more integrated land and yeah. sea kind of marine spatial planning, but it's also coast, it's yeah. actually coastal management. So, yeah. uh, that, that also uh, we have successful yeah. case studies. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. here the, you, in your presentation, you have outlined, you know, the coastlines of Okinawa is changing, and that's astonishing. So, what do you think would be some of the detrimental effects on the environment uh, because of this change in coastline? 
Yes, of course I agree. There, <clears throat> sorry, there must be some sort of connectivity between the oceans and the land. Uh, in Okinawa, I've seen many, many mangrove forests that have been destroyed to put some concrete walls or for landfill and put some, you know, malls. And so we should think about that. And also when we uh, build something, when we build houses, I think we, it's important not to build on the ocean. What we can do to protect also people is to build a little bit farther away from the coastline, because of course the, the reef itself or the mangrove forest is already a protection from uh, a tsunami, for example, mm -hmm. because the waves breaks on the reef edge. So if we instead landfill all the area until the reef edge and we build houses on the reef edge, of course, that's, that's the part where the waves are going to hit stronger. And right. so that's also dangerous for people. And a line of tetrapods is not going to protect you from a big wave. So being smarter and construct farther away from the from the ocean, I think that's one of the main solution that we can we can have. Um, and yeah, of course, I'm not destroying all, all the ecosystem on the coastline as we were saying just now. Yes, I, I totally agree with you, Piera, and I also witnessed that happening, not only in Okinawa, but also the rest of Japan yeah. and also in many parts of the world. Uh, people just, I mean, its coastlines are just lined up with uh, wave breakers and tetrapods. And then you, that leaves us wondering why is it necessary? And of course, we all know it's to protect us from tidal searchers, from, from tsunamis yeah. and whatnot, but, but really, do we need that? And I think it's not a question for me to answer because all of us live in different uh, seascapes, but that I hope that uh, triggers us to think about you know, what impact that it would have on the environment and whether that is necessary. And I do agree with Pierre, it's like that if you're, it's better for us to actually live more inland than on the coastal coastlines. But if we live on the coastlines, then we have to have uh, get pre prepared for those uh, hazards that we might have to face. But uh, so, uh, you know, we if we're closer to the, the coastlines, we're probably also pre adding pressures on, on, on the coastline. So I think it's a balance. Uh, and uh, I we have no definite answers here. We're not uh, environment engineers. But I would like you to, the next time when you see your coastline, thinking about uh, what's really happening to, to your coastline. I think we can take some more questions. Oh, Elena, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was thinking of something I just read in a report. It was on um, just a, a quite recent report about 1,000 rivers um, that would that are responsible for 80% of uh, plastic pollution coming into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and they looked basically look at the top 50, a little bit about the whole river basin activity. And they were looking to see where there was more plastic pollution coming in and what were some of the reasons mm -hmm. for this. And they looked at those rivers that were within 10 kilometers of landfills, for example, that run through uh, and there's about 10 kilometers on either side for, for landfill. Okay. They looked at also concrete. Was there a lot of concrete in the river, on the banks of the river? And that made things, you know, if it's coming from a paved environment, it made plastic really easy to come into the, to the rivers and then flow down. Into the, uh, into the ocean. And they also looked at the length of rivers. I mean, if it's a really short river, it's, it can actually take more plastic into the, into the ocean than longer mm -hmm. rivers. So it was quite an, and quite an interesting um, research that was done. So yes, there is definitely the forest, you know, inland and the river basin and, you know, the connection to the, to the, to the coastline. So it's a really good question actually. Yeah. And, not sure. yeah, and I'm sure the wave breakers are catching the plastics too. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and also heating the waters. I heard from uh, my fisher friends that waters around those those blocks are usually Much really hot. scorchingly yeah. uh, hot, yeah. uh, even on uh, the, the fall. And it's, it's I, they I, capture. I we need more assessments on, <laughs> on these wave breakers. But let's move on to the other questions. Any more uh, questions? That we yes. Get um, maybe let's pick up this one about the access to educational opportunities. 
uh, how, how do you uh, how to reach the people who are not interested in ocean issues or who don't have enough money or time to, to, to follow? Do you have any um, ideas to? Elena is giving me a big smile, so I think she has an idea. <laughs> no, it's a question that I ask. That's why I'm not. <laughs> it's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. How do you bring the coast to people who are are far from the coast, you know? How do you give people that kind of um, feeling of connection to a place that feels so far? Um, how do you give that those people the, the chance to imagine, you know? And that's why we try to, we think of, of art, we think of going through another way to reach people. And we're thinking, I was thinking of the coral um, um, reef um, restoration. If you've never gone into the water and you've never seen coral reef, they don't, well, why is it important? What does it mean? You know, what are some of these issues? So, you know, one thing we, we came across was um, a, a recent research on, um, it was called Healthy Sounds of Coral Reef. And the researcher just made a recording actually of what a healthy coral reef would sound like and played that, that recording in another coral reef that was, you know, needed to be restored and that helped that kind of gave them the impetus. And we can probably relate to that as human beings, how music makes us feel. So how do you connect what, what is close to us uh, with something that seems a little bit foreign? You know, how do we get those common uh, commonalities um, and use you know, really kind of different ways to do it? Because if you tell people, don't do this, don't do that, you lose them. So how do you make them want to, to to, to get there, you know, how to feel. And so that's why we think of these kinds of reaching out in a different way and giving as much, many opportunities as possible for people to experience whatever they can do, whether it's touch or feel or hear or taste. Right, you know. taste, that's true. Uh, that's a, you know, for me, I always tell people to eat, eat, but just not, but don't just eat one species or just one kind of fish, eat a variety of seafood. And then we are, well, we, all of us are based in uh, Japan and uh, Pierre was based here too. And we know that there's so much variety of seafood that we eat here from not only the fishes, but the shellfish to the seaweed to everything. I think it, by eating, I think it gets us interested in where our food sources is coming from and where does this fish live? I mean, before it ends up on my plate. So it actually starts us thinking, I think by eating is also one way to, to have that kind of engagement. But Junko, with your experience working uh, at Chiraumi, uh, aquarium and also at the Japan Wildlife Center. How do you reach out to people? How do you get them interested in oceans? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's a difficult question, but uh, yeah, it's a good way to work with uh, you know kids um, or younger ages. And uh, in Turaumi Aquarium, we had like a beach cleaning events or like a, um, education program for a, school, a local schools. And also when I was working in, in Ishigaki Island, we had an education program to take uh, school children to uh, go to the beach and uh, snorkel with them. So that was uh, very helpful to get them interested in the marine conservation. Yeah, I think marine education starts from young and, yeah. and uh, hopefully we can inspire more people like Piera to decide right. they want to become a marine biologist by yeah. age of seven. <laughs> and uh, it's really important to have that kind of outreach. And I think uh, school children these days are luckier. Mm -hmm. They are getting more of these initiatives uh, or, or people, citizen groups, engaging them and also schools as well. Uh, so I, I hope I'm hoping for a young, bright future of uh, more ocean uh, citizens coming out from a new generation. But any more questions that we think we should address, um, Kiko-san, before we move on to our question? Okay, so there's a one question about how to balance between environmental conservation and uh, tourism promotion. Okay, tourism. Do, so, do you, anyone would like to take that the balance between tourism and trip here? Say something. Uh, I think, but right now I'm I'm collaborating with an NGO that uh, promotes so green tourism and sustainable tourism. I think the way we see tourism uh, uh, can now change a little bit is changing already. So many many places, many resorts, many um, 
uh, diving boats, they are more focused on sustainability. So there are also some uh, NGOs like, like the Ocean Sea that gives guidelines to resorts and to um, tour operators to um, bring tourists also in the water in a sustainable way or to act uh, as a resort as a sustainable. So um, when we decide when we want to go for a holiday, we can also check these, um, uh, these things. So we can check if the, our resort has some sort of certification as a sustainable, if the, your diving boat is sustainable. So this way we can reduce the impact of uh, tourism but still we can uh, also educate the tourists um, on ocean um, uh, sustainability because often our, nowadays there are also some marine biologists working for resorts or diving boats and they explain to people how, what they see underwater but also how to interact with um, uh, ocean species uh, but oh, not only uh, some, for example, some resorts or even some islands, even in Italy, there are some little islands that became plastic free. So they, they totally stopped using um, uh, single use plastic and they became plastic free. So I think this is changing. And of course, maybe we think that tourism can have an impact of the, on the reef, but it depends on the kind of tourism. Of course, if, if we don't, uh, we don't care about uh, and we just go and we, we maybe step on the chorus or we just go diving and touch everything then then it's different but uh, if we we think and we act uh, thinking about the sustainability then I think that that's a good point for the future and the future of tourism. That's a very good point. I think um, the responsibility actually doesn't lie with the marine sports leisure operator only, but also, uh, well, in, in that maybe resort place that we go to, the, the, from the restaurants, from the hotels, if they start to have this right values, so, you know, we're not using plastics, we discourage you from, you know, uh, uh, using that as well, if they educate us before we enter the water, I think we're yeah. very careful. And also, I don't think it's the responsibility of the operators and we ourselves as consumers, we also have had that kind of consciousness about what, how we interact with the environment. Like uh, many places in Europe, you're starting to use the like, coral reef friendly sunscreens, but in Japan it's still very, very unheard of. Although I know there are some efforts in Okinawa starting to do that. You know, we the things that we apply and even the cos cosmetics where we apply, we're guilty of that women. And we enter the water and all this has an impact on the corals, on the seaweeds, on the, on the marine creatures. So we ourselves have to be that uh, agent sometimes. We probably have to educate our marine operators in the place that we go. Don't you think it's funny that I, we, we can step on this reef? You know, things we can correct them. We can be that voice consumers as well. Alana, anything to add from your experience in Fujisawa? Yeah, I was just thinking because we don't have really coral reefs in, in, in Fujisawa. Every year, so. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the beach is flooded with people. No, I know. <laughs> it's what we call sea houses. Exactly. In, I mean, in summertime, there are about a, for this particular beach where we clean in this area, 100,000 100, tourists coming in. Small, it's a relatively small area if you think about it. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a matter of, yeah, the education, the, but where does the education start? Does it start where you, as soon as you step off the train, for example, um, should there be more um, disposal convenience so people, because this is where, what we see in our area, it's basically looking at, um, you know, more marine litter, and, you know, and, and waste more, more so than people treading uh, in the sea, you know what I mean? So it, it really is a, a question of education and how do you reach people and how do you give them the opportunity to, um, to engage because a lot of things in, in Japan usually you, you take your for example you take your garbage back with you you don't leave it behind but if you're thinking about tourists who are there just for the day or just you know you know they're going to fly away uh, uh, um, a day after they may not have a place to take it back to so how do you deal with that you know so how, yeah, all sorts of the, these kinds of questions um, are not always answered but 
uh, there has been some um, initiatives with with uh, with the city where they have actually created um, garbage boxes specifically for this kind of of um, tourism and also social impact tourism, meaning those people who are going to the beach, enjoying the view and cleaning up at the same time. Um, so there is that, but uh, it would be lovely to see something a little bit that goes, you know, from the beach as you walk to the stores, to the restaurants, so that you have a whole like virtuous um, kind of sustainable cycle. You know, that would be lovely to see. So you know, less single use plastic, uh, you know, using eco bags a little bit more, things like that. That would be really, really lovely to see. And it's, it's possible. So let's- it's possible. Let's yeah, I'm with you, Rwanda. So I think we <laughs> still have many good questions coming in, but I'm so sorry we are about time. So I'd like to conclude this panel discussion with just a last message from each of our speakers on what landscape or no, and seascapes do you want to see and what are your hopes for the ocean decade? Maybe I'll start from Alana, then Junko, then Piera. That was quick, okay. <laughs> Um, yes, so I think I'd like to see, as far as research is concerned, I think I'd like to see how communities can get involved more. Um, of course, want to know the natural science, want to know, you know, inform us on these kinds of actions, but also what, you know, who are the key stakeholders, who are the companies that are involved, which, you know, what, uh, what can we do as, an, uh, as a consumer? What can we do as an individual? And maybe how can we all kind of work together? So you have NGOs working with you know, public sector, private sector, NGO sector, it's just, um, all working together. I mean, that kind of research would be kind of, kind of, kind of cool to see more of uh, in, this, in this decade that's coming up. Um, and I guess, you know, the course where we are here in, in Fujisawa, it's, it's multi-use. So you have fishing, you have marine leisure, you have all sorts of things going on. So how can we coexist and, and leave um, um, less environmental stress on the area? You know, so how, that would be something to look forward to. Like, how can we really create um, a place where everybody is kind of finding their way um, and not leaving no, no harm behind, you know? So that would be the one thing that would be lovely to see. And again, it's possible because everybody's working towards the same goal, you know? So, so that would be the, that would be my wish. True. Thank you, Elena. Junko, what are your uh, Yeah, uh, we are talking about like uh, natural coastline versus uh, artificial coastline. But uh, where I live, like I live in Kamakura near uh, Yugahama. And when I was looking at the map, I found that uh, the nearest natural coastline from the center of Tokyo is actually Yugahama, where I live. Like all the yeah, all the coastline is already artificial. So you know, I would like to keep the you know natural coastline, and with the help of you know local people, as Alana mentioned, and uh, for the decade of ocean science. Um, I think uh, the plastic pollution is now a very, very big issue. So I need, we need more research about the plastic pollution and how it's impacting our ecosystem and also like how to stop uh, the plastic pollution. Uh, yeah, that's my, <laughs> that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. And Piera? Uh, yeah, I agree about the protection of coastlines, of course, and I really hope for Okinawa to maintain its natural coast that remains natural. And I, I think it's really important to keep doing education for everyone, even not only scientists and marine biologists, but for everyone so that people can fall in love with the ocean and understand the importance of prote protecting it. And also, I would say the importance and the big impact that overfishing has uh, for the for the ocean. So I hope people can start thinking that everything we decide to do or everything we decide to eat has an impact of the ocean, and we should think about more what we what we eat. Uh, that would be a really good point for <laughs> for the decades of the ocean. Thank you, Pira. And for myself, I would like to see that, that there's more understanding of the land and the sea connections where we look at the problem of the sea very often 
we are really creating the problems from land. So I hope that we can give more emphasis on this connection and also emphasis on the ocean life because uh, people that are living there who are protecting our oceans for us and also conserving the land for us. And most importantly, uh, it's not really discussed here today, but also the indigenous peoples and the local communities, the IPLCs, their rich no local knowledge, how then we can bridge this uh, with science uh, for the ocean decade. So with that, uh, I conclude the panel discussion and uh, back to you, Miki san And thank you again, friends. Okay, thank you very much for our presenters for meaningful and very interesting and stimulating uh, panel discussion. So uh, it's time to close the webinar. And so at the closing, I would like to thank you for giving many very, very important and essential questions uh, to our audiences. And I think these questions are really a key uh, message to launch uh, ocean, UN Ocean Decade. So this is so essential. And I also, uh, again, ex um, Thank you for all present us today for excellent uh, discussions. So for, thank you very much. So for audiences, uh, if you close, uh, if you exit this webinar, you will find the questionnaire uh, pages. So those who have time, please kindly uh, give your feedback or opinions further for our webinars. It will be very, very important feedback for us to build the further partnership with you all. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you and discuss you again. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you for joining us at the World Oceans Day by Mena OYK. Enjoy the World Oceans Day, especially you. Kiana. You just bye -bye. started the day. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you.